I think the 1,500 companies in the world that have committed to meaningful carbon reduction, 1,500 large companies will be needing every voluntary credit that they can possibly get to meet the targets that they have put out there. And they are bound, in many cases legally bound, to meet those objectives. Their, their investors expect it from them. So it's going to be a great time to be in the carbon credit business. Lionel Cambites joins me now. He's the executive chairman of Delta Clean Tech. Trades on the CSE under the symbol DELT and on the in the United States under the symbol DCTIF. Lionel, welcome. Well, thank you very much, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Lionel, let's start with an overview. What is the business of Delta Clean Tech? Delta Clean Tech is in the carbon dioxide capture business. We capture carbon dioxide from every smokestack in the world, and we take those car that carbon dioxide and we develop the uh, carbon credits for those. So we fundamentally produce streaming carbon credits using carbon dioxide capture technology. That's our core business. Um, so what by what mechanism do you sequester carbon to achieve these carbon credits? Yeah, the first thing to do is to capture it. We capture it out of smokestacks. Smokestacks concentrate carbon is what they do. Now you've got a, a coal-fired power plant with 12 to 14 percent carbon in the exhaust. That's a perfect target. So we'll take that exhaust, we'll run it through our CO2 capture system, and we'll capture carbon dioxide to 99 percent pure out of that exhaust stream. So that's really the primary target is to capture from exhaust because that's where the concentration of carbon dioxide is. Sure. So then what do you do with the captured carbon? Well, that's, there, there's two things to do today, and there's some that are emerging. The easy story is that you can drill a hole and just put it deep down in the ground forever, but that's more expensive, and that's still doable. Second thing is you can use, you can use it for enhanced oil recovery, a bit of a contradiction, but when you use carbon dioxide in these oil reservoirs, it makes the oil flow more miscible, and then when the reservoir is, is emptied of oil, the carbon dioxide will then permanently put itself in that reservoir and be capped off there. So those are the two biggest applications today. But right in front of us, and part of the Carbon X Prize in Calgary that we were the participants in, was to have these new technologies that take carbon dioxide and make products from them. So, for example, the winner of the Carbon X Prize for the use of CO2 was a company called Carbon Cure, which is putting carbon dioxide in concrete to make it stronger and sequester and make it stronger. So there's about a dozen new technologies emerging, James, that are going to take carbon, monoxide, carbon dioxide and make products out of them. So that's where the future lies. Apart from carbon credits, how do you generate revenue? We generate revenue on the on the, the 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 use of the technology, whether you're capturing carbon dioxide or we're perhaps incinerating and destroying methane, which are the two big big, as you know, uh, GHG emitters. Um, we would charge typically a royalty to do that. If we gave you our technology to use, you would pay us a royalty to be able to use that technology. Have you? got any government subsidy or grant? We, we did in the early years of our technology development. We, we invested about $30 million in our technology development through 06, 7, 8, and 9. And there was always an opportunity to, to have some grant funding when we were doing the, er, the early research on the technology. The technology is now commercialized. It's shovel ready. It's robust. It's real. And now the, the grants are more involved when you're actually doing the projects. So as we start signing on for new projects, then we'll be able to expose ourselves to more grants at that point. But the technology development is done. And uh, we have participated, James, in the first 10 years of our existence, we participated in over 50% of all the carbon capture projects in the world. So we are a, a true a Canadian champion in, in capturing carbon dioxide. Okay, let's talk a bit about the carbon credit market now. What does that look like in Canada? How do you get them? How do you sell them? Who's the buyer of them? And is there, is there, are the mandates, are there laws in place to force companies who are emitters to buy carbon credits at this point? There's a compliance market, a compliance 
carbon credit market is quite easy, where the government is, 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 is implemented punitive taxation, and they have approved credits that can be used against them. And let's use carbon to CO2 capture as an approved credit now is a good one. Then there's the voluntary market, which we have <clears throat> significant expertise in, and that's where the real opportunity that's where the real opportunity lies the, in, the, in the voluntary market. Those are the markets where the fidelity, the fidelity of that credit, maybe, maybe it isn't approved by this government or that government, but we know it's a bona fide carbon credit. Let's use, uh, let's use no-till agriculture, which sequesters carbon in the ground. So that's considered a low fidelity carbon credit. So that as that carbon credit is is initiated and registered on a carbon credit registry, its fidelity will improve because there'll be more science proving that the carbon's in the ground, and that will increase in value. So we see a, I predict a very buoyant carbon market. The compliance credit markets are going to go up. And I think the voluntary carbon credits are going to go up exponentially. I think the 1,500 companies in the world that have committed to meaningful carbon reduction, 1,500 large companies, will be needing every voluntary credit that they can possibly get to meet the targets that they have put out there. And they are bound, in many cases legally bound, to meet those objectives. Their, their investors expect it from them. So it's going to be a great time to be in the carbon credit business. How far away are we from uh, the reality everybody is forced to offset carbon credits? Well, we're, it's happening as we speak right now. I mean, here's an example. In, in prior to 2009, when the carbon, the global carbon credit market collapsed, as you know, with the global financial crisis, the European carbon market and the rest of the carbon markets in the world collapsed. You and I know it's essential for us to be successful, to have a currency. We need a carbon currency to actually do what we say that you just said. I'm fat, you're thin, let's do it this way. I, that's such a great analogy. That's what we need. It's essential that we have this, this, this bona fide carbon currency to do that. And right now, so an example is in 2007, eight, you know, we traded over $30 million worth of carbon credits on the Chicago Climate Exchange, and they were voluntary credits. They were agricultural credits that, that were voluntary, and they were worth a little less than the full compliance credits. But you see, there'll be, there'll be lower fidelity credits, and there'll be high fidelity credits, and there'll be a, a, there'll be a path along the way. And then, you know, as, as you would fully expect, in, you know, as we speak today, the ability to take a credit, move it into the blockchain and create a currency, a, a, a currency on the credit so people like you and I can trade them with each other. We don't have to always go through the, the Western Exchange or the Reggie Exchange. There's 29 exchanges in the world, but let's say London is a big one. But if you and I want to trade carbon credits, we have to also move them into a currency that we can trade back and forth. So the next thing, of course, is blockchain to crypto, and there'll be a, a clean carbon credit crypto token out there. There'll be several of those in the next, uh, in the next uh, very little while, there'll be several of those available as well. I'm curious as to how much interest has the company received from uh, institutional investors seeking ESG investments at this point? A lot, a lot. We, we, we feel the tremendous amount of incoming. And further to your last quest, further to your last comments where you asked a series of questions, this is really what the companies that are inbound to us are doing. They're, they want to they understand where the solution is. Should they be technology installers? Should they be carbon credit purchasers? Can they install technology? You know, some of the companies that have, have done such a good job of saying that we're going to reduce our footprint by 2050, they don't have the capability in their own infrastructure to reduce their carbon dioxide that much. They're going to have to go outside and buy that voluntary credit. So establishing whether within your own organization you can actually – sequester and reduce your carbon footprint enough to meet your objectives is quite a is a scramble to get that done right now to understand that and when we do it may put a lot of pressure on the value of voluntary carbon credits and that's where i see the opportunity have you had any sort of discussion with the original equipment manufacturers who build 
you know, the, the, the assembly lines that result in emissions where they can actually install your technology in line at the point of origin in a brand new build? Yeah, clearly. And, and uh, the good news is that we retrofit as, as, uh, as cost effectively as we, as we OEM. We can, we can install into an OEM line or we can retrofit. And it's one of those occasionally you get a great technology that doesn't interrupt the, that doesn't interrupt the industrial process. You can retrofit very easily. So we're lucky in that regard. Well, Lionel, we're going to have to leave it there for now. All the best to you. You bet. Same to you. Bye for now. <laughs>